Okay, a very good evening to one and all. Uh, we are so happy and pleased to welcome you to our uh, Onam celebration that we take uh, digitally. Uh, for those of you who are uh, coming encountering Dakshin Chitra for the first time, we are an organized, we are a muse heritage museum situated in Mutukada ECR. And uh, here we have a, a different, uh, we have architecture, art, culture, we have 18 houses from various uh, uh, communities across South India and uh, spread over 10 acres, it's a beautiful campus. And uh, every year we celebrate various uh, folk festivals uh, apart from other contemporary festivals. And uh, we have uh, state started taking, uh, we wanted to engage uh, all of you digitally and uh, uh, we set up this uh, talk and uh, before I go on to the introduction, just a few uh, basic meeting hygiene. Uh, all of you, please uh, keep your mute um, uh, mics on mute and uh, videos on uh, switched off because people who don't have data connectivity can also join in. Uh, keep uh, posting us your questions in the chat box. We'll pick it up after the session. And, uh, and the session is recorded. And I think that Zoom has given you the heads up. And that's it from my end. And over to uh, Gita Hudson, she'd be doing the introductions. Thank you. Uh, hi, Lakshmi, Venkataman. Thank you so much for putting this whole program together. I know you've been working on this for a while. And very happy Onam to all of you. Uh, Dakshin Sutra staff uh, joined me in uh, wishing you all. Uh, we do have the uh, Floral competition, school column competition for our housekeepers. They get so excited and they win prizes. This year, um, the trends of Dakshin Chitra thought that we give them nice gifts instead of this competition. So, made this huge column at the reception area and a few other areas. So, I'm thankful to all our housekeepers. And um, this is a very interesting subject because all of us know floral paintings and we take very casually, but we do not know experts in this field who have taken that to a different level. The paintings you see behind me are also known as company paintings. The originals were done in um, 1850s, 60s, 70s in the Chennai School of Art, which is called the Art College, the Government Arts College, which was called the School of Arts and Crafts. So it was started by Alexander Hunter, as you know, but Henry Nolte who is the uh, taxonomist and curator for uh, Royal Botanical Gardens Edinburgh. I was there a couple of years back and I was so excited to see the original drawings done by our Naidus and so many others from Chennai. Uh, since then, um, it was the uh, Madras, uh, Madras was together, all the states were together. So some of these artists are from Andhra and some from Chennai and they've done this beautiful, these are reproductions, what you see behind me, and they are done in imperial size papers and they are preserved in Edinburgh even today. And uh, you can't just go and look at them, but they're all preserved so well. And uh, yeah, that's about these, uh, because they didn't have so much of photography then, they wanted to record them and see how beautifully our local artists have recorded the fauna and flora of the, uh, of the locality of mainly Chennai and surrounding area. Uh, it's a huge subject, but we move on to today's program. And I'm very thankful to Parvati Nair and Gita and Dilip Sachdev, uh, who have done a lot of work connecting florals and their uh, area of art. Uh, Parvati Nair is a familiar uh, name in Chennai art field. She's been part of many exhibitions. And I know her well for her a recent uh, installation on uh, water based, you know, the, the, the dunk material she used and used and done this huge wave. Uh, and then I know she's very involved with uh, ecology and she's closely worked with Smithyanand and all the people who are very, very environment and ecology conscious. And as an artist, she has contributed to her videos, her photographs, and uh, uh, she's a multidisciplinary artist. Who, not only paints, but uh, uh, does videos and installations and uh, other allied uh, uh, mediums. And uh, very happy to have you, Parvati. And I never knew you did uh, something to do with florals. And I saw some of the slides quickly, but they are wonderful. And uh, like all the rest of us uh, here, I'm also looking forward. 
forward to listen to you and view your artwork. And uh, moving on to uh, Geeta Anjali Satchev. Uh, she's been with the Srishti School of Art and Design in Bangalore, which is very well known for design, uh, one of the best design schools in the country. And she's been there for the last 25 years. And she's currently with a PhD and been working on her PhD. Uh, what is very interesting is she has linked uh, botanical art uh, with the and uh, design practices in India. Uh, if I had missed out on anything, I I request Parvati and uh, Gita and to throw more light on your work that you're doing now. And uh, thank you again, and thank you all the participants. And we move on to Parvati's uh, presentation first. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. And thank you, Gita, for that lovely introduction. And as always, it's great to be back at J Dakshin Chitra and to work with you. And I think, you know, uh, thank you too for the introduction to Geetanjali. I think we've had, you know, wonderful conversations about flowers and we look forward to sharing some of those with you. So let me start with screen sharing. And I will start my slideshow. Right, so as the slideshow sort of tells you, I'm dealing with you know, both the scientific, the symbolic, and the ritualistic in my art. So something that is as you know, beautiful and as selfless as flowers, how can we not be fascinated by them? And the fascination goes back a long, long way to our ancestors who were fascinated with their potential for gardens, for perfume, for medicinal uses, for food, as fodder for creative, uh, writing and images and visuals and, you know, all this sort of thing. But I think to Sorry. Was I muted all this while? No, I'm no, sorry. no. Ah, so, um, well, I was sort of talking about you know how from ancient times flowers have fascinated human beings for a variety of reasons but now i think we applaud them because they're such a critical part of our ecosystem of a healthy diverse ecosystem which is under so much threat and without them as well the world would be an infinitely boring place so i've worked with flowers actually for many many years uh, exploring how they open our doors to socio-cultural, political, ritualistic lives. And flowers in their generosity lend themselves to being symbolic, scientific, ritualistic, and much more. And as sort of Gita has said, you know, sort of already mentioned in her introduction, the, one of the true threads through my, to my art is water. So I guess it was sort of inevitable that the entry point into flowers for me initially was through water and the lotus, a flower that grows in water. This is a work called The Lotus Effect, and it's a large, very large sort of three panel work. And it plays with the seen and the unseen. So on the top, you see a drop of water, you know, trembling on the lotus leaf. Underneath, you see what that looks like under a microscope. And then you see something strange and interesting, which is that though the lotus grows out of the water, its leaves repel the water. It's a term called superhydrophobicity, which means that, you know, the, the, this action of repelling is something that has fascinated uh, scientists and philosophers and poets from time immemorial, because it's been a metaphor and a simile to talk at one level. Uh, uh, sorry, am I mute again? No, no, it's fine. Sorry. So I was sort of saying that this thing of being in the water, right, growing from the water, and yet not being off the water is something that has been a metaphor for living in the world and yet not being of the world. And I think some of the mysticism and the sacred qualities of the flower come from this, this sort of oxymoronic ability. So I've been interested in both 
the sacred and the scientific where the lotus is concerned. And moving on, I sort of played with this idea of being in the water, not in the water, in a work like this, where a three-dimensional quality comes into the work, where it's not just flat. For, you know, for those who didn't read the, the panel, most almost all of what I do is on wood. This is hand-drawn graphite on, on wood. And with, with the floral work, very often there is a mixed media or a color element that comes in. And I like to create on wood because then I think of it as an object in a way that, that breathes the air that you breathe, that it, it's not behind glass, it, it exists in the space that you exist. And so here we have the flower of the water, but growing out of it to receive the sun. I find that when I work with, with uh, an idea and I kind of extend it into series, it allows me to develop ideas as in this one, which you will see about the rhythms and the cycles of nature. So the, the initial works were very large. The, this series that I'm going to show you is really small. You sort of can hold it in your hand. And so you start here again with water, which replenishes and grows life. But then you move on to the circle of the lotus of the bud which, you know, the, you know the, the starting of life, which is, you know, the start of the cycle of life and nature. And then, you know, the blossom opens, life progresses. And then there is a centeredness where you come to the full potential of life or nature or the flower in this case. And then it's over, you know, the, the petals have gone and it's denuded and, and the cycle is over. But yet at the same time, as you can see within this sort of denuded flower are the seeds, which are both sort of symbolic of continuing the cycle and also of you know, the planting of ideas, the movement of ideas. So you see how the flower is a way of talking about ideas and using that ideas as sort of ripples that move out and interact with other ideas. The next flower that I'm dealing with this morning is the poppy. And this is a series called Here It Is Said That, which talks about the poppy as a flower of remembrance and a flower that um, has a very, has a darker side to it is, as you know, and it's a flower that makes us remember the war, especially the first world war. It's worn on lapels and it's, you know, there are poppies sort of scattered uh, at functions involving the First World War. What's not known so much is the Indian involvement, the, the involvement of Indian soldiers in the First World War. And the title of the piece itself arises from a letter written by a wounded soldier in the First World War, so here it is said that, and it features in the work. And one of the places where, um, you know, a lot of these soldiers died was in Flanders in, in Belgium. And there is, you know, the, in fact, the poppy sort of, its association with the war comes from that very famous poem um, about the killing field of Flanders and that it's called in Flanders field and it also features in this work. So as you can see, it's, you know, it's a set of boxes in which you see the glory of the poppy as a flower. And again, it's all pencil. It's, it's just pencil on wood with its mixed media elements. And you also see other elements of the poppy, the, the poppy seeds, the poppy pollen, what the poppy looks like under a microscope, which is something I always like to do to change your level of perception so that you kind of see again in a different way, something that you thought you knew really well. And if you're talking about sustainability and the human component in sustainability, it's very difficult to do that without some acknowledgement of war and the devastation it causes, which is where this work sort of comes into play. There is a variety of uh, imagery here, including, you know, the unknown soldier, the, the actual, you know, the dedication to the unknown soldier, which exists at the Menin Gate in Ypres in France, through which you know the soldiers, so many of them went to their grave, and even now, uh, it's from I want to say 1928, 
at eight o'clock every day, they, the last post is still played there. And I was deeply moved by this idea of how the poppy signifies both sort of uh, memory and an acknowledgement of what went before. It, you know, I did think, you know, I did discuss with Geetu about what sort of work to bring in. And I think finally, I also brought in the poppy because ideas of war and the darker ways in which we exploit nature seem so relevant even today. I mean, our news waves are filled with news of Afghanistan. And, you know, so the poppy is a beautiful flower, but it is also resonant with our times. It is not just something that is incredibly beautiful. It has perhaps, unfortunately, a dark beauty to it as well. Moving away into a, you know, a, a, a tree that uh, is associated with a flower that many of you may not be sort of so familiar with, and that is the tamarind. The, my interest in the tamarind actually arose from a series of videos that I did for a show called Anthesis, curated by Girish Shahane, where the, the origins of the work was that I grew up, when I grew up, there was this tamarind tree and my childhood was sort of spent, you know, with this tree as an intrinsic part of it. And I left and when I came back by accident or design, I continued, I came back to the place I had grown up in, in Chennai. And then Varta came and this tamarind tree was felled and it sort of felt like this very tangible, part of your childhood being taken away. And the tree was so huge to sort of take it away. We had to bring in people who chopped up the tree and cut it down. And I filmed that with no purpose. It was filmed and kept aside. And then much later for the show, I thought, well, let me sort of move away from my personal journey and look to the journey of the tree. And I found out to, you know, to my interests, you know, that tree which we think of as such an intrinsic part of our life is actually not Indian it comes from Africa but then as a botanist told me you know sort of what is what is alien and what is real you know when this tree has come and been with us and been such a part of our lives for so long you know what does the term alien mean anymore and again you know I felt you know when he said that that whole resonance that we have today with the idea of immigration with you know, with the idea of the alien and the other and, you know, the, the protection of space. And here in nature, we see this generosity of spirit. So I took a journey with, uh, went to Dindigal in Madurai and met, you know, a group of women. I was so fortunate to meet Mahalakshmi and her family who work with the tamarind the year around. And, you know, to them, it's sort of everything. It's, it's a god. It's something that gives life and sustenance the year around and so i showed these four films together you know the journey of the tree my journey then i sort of showed tamarind to people in chennai and they tasted it and i recorded their reactions i filmed my mother cooking you know pulinji which is definitely one of the dishes that we have for onam and you know she's cooked it for tomorrow so we're all very excited by this as well as just abstract play with, with the tamarind. And uh, it, it sort of features in the hottest Malabaricus, which Geetu will talk about later. So it's a tree which, which has deep roots in our life and our culture. And here displayed is, is a flower of the tamarind, which is incredibly small. So I've blown it up out of proportion, but it's incredibly beautiful too. And this is a sort of modern sort of botanical rendering of it. I showed you both the size of it as well as how it looks when you hang it, because for me, that play of shadows is also an important way in which you receive the drawing. So, the, you know, the first one was the tamarind bark tree leaves. This is the gorgeous tamarind flower. And this is another piece on the tamarind, which sort of talks about the journey of the tamarind from Africa. You know, the film was called The Tree That Went For A Walk. And on the, on the left side of your screen, you have the names of the tamarind in Africa, and then, you know, the flower and the seeds, and then the different names we have for it in India. So it really is a traveling tree. And this again is how it looks when it's, this is a small work, um, but sort of is moved away from the wall and it's sort of a play of 
light and shadow and color and the pencil work. So now you'll have to bear with me because I want to show you a tiny clip of, of, the, of one of the films because it's also set to music by Vedan Bharadwaj. And I felt that, uh, you know, we found uh, like dohas and poetry and sayings about the tamarind in Tamil and in Hindi. And uh, it, it really was, and I'm going to just take it to a little bit inside because it is, it's a longish film. And this is my tree being cut up. Pudichalu, puli angombai, puli kanu. Pudichalu, puli angombai, puli kanu. Pudichalu, puli angombai. to the last flower that I'm going to talk about this evening, which is the Ixora, which is the Chetti and, you know, uh, definitely such an intrinsic part of Kerala, of growing up, of making the poo columns, the, the Rangoli with, with Chetti, you know, when you grew up. And this is a large work. Uh, and the flowers that are, or the plants that are used in this work are all flowers and trees and fruit that are sacred to a dance form, well, to a ritualistic worship stroke dance form called Teyam. And you see here the, the jackfruit. This is one of the panels which shows the frangipani, the jackfruit, and the Ixora. So again, it was sort of water which led me to this work. I have been reading about the floods in Kerala and, you know, it was, uh, I mean, there was the 2018 flood and along with it so much about how this organization of women called Kudumbashri pitched in to, you know, from their own hard earned savings to help those in need. And I, you know, it was just very, very, very sort of moving for me. And I thought the necessities of female empowerment and the retuning to a proverbial inner goddess are not sort of two mutually exclusive propositions. So this sort of led me, you know, the, the feminist part of it led me to Teyam where, uh, you know, there are many forms, 450, I believe, forms of Teyam, but there is only this one called Devakuta, which is performed by a woman. And that too by a woman from the Malayan community. So from an indigenous tribe, which has sort of, you know, a lot of anthropological import to it. And so I created this work and I'm just showing this to sort of give you a sense of, you know, the scale of the work where I worked with this idea of the floods and this performance of Devakuta where it's a very simple story. It's a story of an Apsara who comes down to earth in search of beautiful flowers to um, this uh, Tekumbada island, which is off Kandur. And, you know, she's sort of so lost among the beauty of the flowers that she gets lost. The, her companions go in and she's stuck. But eventually she finds her way back, for which we're all very happy. So she came to be known as Valli or a power. And, you know, the local inhabitants created this kuta or this dance performance around her. So in my work, I'm sort of uh, recasting her as uh, I'm going to jump, uh, slide and then come back to it. I'm sort of recasting this whole thing of being lost and found in nature, where I 
break up the components of the story. You know, you, there is the Kava or the sacred grove. There is the Ixora, which is, you know, used for the, you know, the, the decoration and the bullets and the, and the costume of the Devakuta dancer. There is the, the, the mirror, which is, you know, both the Aran Mulla Kanadi, which is made in Kerala, but also in Teyam, you have that moment of Mukha Darshanam, where, you know, the ordinary performer sort of sees his true or her true nature in the mirror and, you know, is transported and becomes sort of someone who's divine. And there is also, you know, the reference to the Nair Tarwadas, many of whom were very instrumental in keeping these forms alive. The, you know, Teyam is a form that has always had Bhagavati worship or, you know, or many forms of Teyam have had the worship of the goddess at the center of it. And therefore, the, the female presence has always been strong. But with Devakuta, I felt, you know, there was a way of talking about how, you know, there is the possibilities of empowerment and the possibilities of finding oneself again, you know, in a feminist spirit. So at the center of this uh, of these panels, which are sort of six feet high and each panel is two feet long, so it's about six by 12 feet, uh, you see the, the Teyam cloth and a maze created out of it. And just as an interesting story, when I was sort of doing this, I kept thinking, what, what, you know, what will this woman find at the center of the maze herself? How do I represent that? How is this sort of repositioning of a woman done? And I ran into Leela Samson and I was sort of talking about this and she sent me this lovely shloka that in her handwriting, which I have sort of redone and pinned to the side, which sort of says at the center, there is only space, there is only Akasha. And I thought that was, you know, just a beautiful way of talking about what it means to, to search and to find, to be lost and to be found again. And again, in this work too, it was shown in, it was part of a, a collateral show of the Kochi Biennale. And it was shown uh, along with a video. So you sort of saw this moving image as well as this. And the video was a sort of abstract translation of the idea of the Apsara who comes and gets lost, with, which had Sangeeta Shiv Kumar doing an alapna in Rag Purunji, which is the raga in which the, you know, the folk songs are sung. So I'm just again going to go back and play you a tiny clip of that, just to give you a sense of how the work was received it's a still work, but there was, you know, this, uh, this video that happened. lost and found and sort of in maybe conclusion <clears throat> we've talked about you know flowers as um, you know 
adding to the biodiversity part of this, you know, the whole cycle of nature, you know, whether it's perfume or gardens, ordering your personal space as religious motive, as motives of sociocultural togetherness. But at the end of it, I also feel that there is something sort of very intrinsic and um, essential about flowers. They, they are there, you know, unapologetically beautiful for reasons that we don't know. And I feel that in that way, they speak very fundamentally about what it means to be human, to be here, to be in this space. Why are we here? What does it mean? Why are we? And on that note, I will hand over with the Exora to Gita to continue this conversation. Uh, Parvati is just uh, really brilliant in the sense, you know, I know of very little, very few contemporary artists who have taken flowers as a theme, and I haven't seen your CV, the way you combine stylized floral patterns alongside, you know, uh, real visuals and the way you kind of uh, link the politics with uh, flowers, um, you know, like a thematic, uh, the lotus was really beautiful, lotus series followed by poppy which had uh, political undercurrents, and then the pulley, uh, the tam tamarind tree, which is, you know, uh, all over Tamil Nadu and all the highways, and yes, we try, and, you know, they found these canopy everywhere, and uh, there's uh, lots of stories behind um, tamarind trees, and the song that uh, we heard just now was Puli and Kumba. In Tamil, they say, oh, you got, you hooked on to this, um, uh, a wealthy guy or you know a smart guy they use the word i i still have to figure out after listening to the song i'm wondering why did they even use the term you know you fully and they'll say that and <laughs> i i really don't know i'm curious to go and figure out why did they compare uh, a tamarind branch or a tree to uh you know to get, find a, a better groom or a bride so yes it was all um, very informative and the uh, way you had handled uh, uh, everyday flowers, you've taken it to a different level in uh, the contemporary sense. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm sure uh, lots of the viewers uh, would like to see more of your work uh, in uh, exploring floral um, uh, themes as well as other themes. I know you've done a lot of mapping earlier on, but this was fresh because after COVID, we all lost track of what was happening uh, in the artist studio. So it was really nice to refresh and uh, figure out uh, the new, newer aspects of uh, contemporary art in Chennai. And thank you so much. And I think the question and answers will be after Gitanjali's uh, presentation. Am I right, Lakshmi? Yes. Yeah. So after the session. Uh, uh, once again, I welcome Gitanjali. And you can go about with continuing where Parvati left, where it's all about, uh, you know, botanical drawing, uh, which has always been intriguing to everyone because they are, they are, they are so different. They are so real. And um, why should we even, if painters do, how is it different uh, when it becomes a, when drawings, botanical drawings become contemporary paintings? You know, there will be some link or a thin line which differentiates both. And uh, I'm so happy that you've taken this topic and you're exploring uh, botanical drawings with design and uh, art. So very keen to listen to you as well. Welcome. Thank you, Gita, and please for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Gita. It's a good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this event today, especially so with uh, Parvati, who I met for the first time through this. And uh, thank you. Lakshmi and Gita for inviting me and many thanks also to everyone at Dakshina Chitra. Um, you know, I'm honored to be part of your Onam celebrations this year. Uh, I thought, I, yeah, just let me pull up the screen where I will begin with the Exora, which is where Parvati left. Okay. So, um, I thought I would start by sharing a recent project where, where the Exora featured since Parvati ended her presentation with this flower uh, in the context of such a rich interpretation of the Thayam ritual in Kerala. So this image on the left is an illustration of the Exora by the artist Lisa Rasmussen. 
and it was part of a large series, larger series called Iterant Flora that uh, was inspired by the use of plant motifs by Raja Ravi Varma. Varma is considered among the greatest painters in the history of Indian art and was also from Kerala. Uh, all the botanical illustrations that you see are plants that were identified in Raja Ravi Varma's paintings. Uh, So you can see the exora here in Varma's Damayanti. It's near her right hand uh, and it's, you know, on the forest floor. It's, a, it's really small, but, uh, you know, it's an orange fly and it's star shaped. So you can spot it right, right over there. So really this project, uh, you know, I was researching the flowers used by Varma to draw upon them really as a teaching and learning resource. Uh, I did the project with the Raja Ravi Varma Heritage Foundation in Bangalore with support from its managing trustee, Gita Maini. And I'm not a scholar of Varma's work, but it was really the sheer beauty and scope in the way he used plants that fascinated me. You know, he's used plants in so many different ways in the landscapes and environments that he depicted in the form of background foliage as decoration and ornament and in the depiction of, of rituals. The puja thali with flowers is very often seen in his paintings as are floral garlands. And you know, the aim of this project really was to open up an area, an avenue for the study of flowers and plants through his work. So we identified 46 plants across 33 paintings initially, and we worked with a team of experts that involved both uh, botanists and taxonomists. Slide. Okay, so yeah. so um, in the next stage of the project, uh, you know, I worked with Lisa and I asked uh, Lisa, who was a uh, botanical illustrator as well, to create traditional uh, black and white illustrations of the flowers that uh, of all the plants that we had identified in Varma's work, and I asked her to draw the plant in the same position and in the same perspective as we saw them in Varma's paintings and. Um, you know, so if we place the images side by side, we could easily identify the plant that Lisa had drawn. And uh, that's the, the hibiscus that you can see in Damayanti and the jasmine in Maharani Lakshmi Bai. After this, uh, after this, we went to Lal Bagh. So we worked with the horticulture department at the Lal Bagh Botanical Gardens in Bangalore and identified real plants corresponding to the ones that Varma had uh, painted. And all this culminated in an uh, introductory workshop on plants at Srishti, where you know, the participants were exposed to uh, three different types of uh, plant representations. They saw the realistic ones done by Varma, they saw the black and white illustrations done by Lisa, and then they actually went and saw the actual plant in, in Lalpa. So this, uh, you know, my focus on different types of plant representations has really come from my own questioning about what the pedagogy or the teaching approach for plant studies, art and design should be in India. Uh, botanical art is, uh, you know, the field that concerns itself with the study of plants through art has been most closely associated with the scientific illustration of plants. This is because during the time of colonial expansion, starting in the 1600s, there was a need to document plants accurately for medicinal purposes and scientists had to work very closely with artists. So the image on the left that you see uh, is from the Hortus malabaricus, which uh, Parvati got up earlier and which documented over 700 plants in Kerala. And these are, you know, just, these are traditional botanical illustrations that you find in the book. But if you look on the right hand side, you know, I used to see such varied uses of both real plants and plant motifs in the art and craft traditions of India. Many of them were deeply rooted in our ritual practices. And I knew that teaching botanical art in India could be framed very expansively. Um, the image on the right is a, is a bus decorated with, um, you know, banana leaves and uh, a garland of flowers. And I took this image during Ayur Puja. You know, it's a ritual where we worship uh, our tools and our equipment that we use as a form of gratitude. The other image also is of a kolam, and you know we are here this evening to mark kol onam. By making this floral mat or the ku kolam is a very significant form of ritual art. It's a welcoming for King Mahabali to enter our homes, and the kolam during onam is made with flowers, and hence it's called the ku kolam, right? Where the ku refers to the ku or the pool or the flower.
my research into the kolam actually started around 2009 over 10 years ago you know when i worked with closely with a video artist called smriti mera she was running her flower project at that time and that took us into the flower markets and the trading practices that she had been filming uh, through her project she was specifically looking at the jasmine trade at that time and the images on the left that you see are from bangalore's famous kr flower market uh, the images on the right are from Rangeen Rangoli, which is uh, another project where both Smriti and I worked together with another performance artist called Deepak Srinivasan. And here we used flowers and rice powder to map information on an, in an empty parking lot. You know, the parking lot was our canvas, so to speak. Uh, Deepak had asked the public to map spaces of courtship during this project. And here we were using flowers and rice powder, but really as a means of expression and not for ritual purposes. Uh, fast forward to uh, 2019 and 2020, where I started researching the use of plants in protests and protest movements. And uh, this area, uh, you know, research revealed a range of critical issues that involve plants today, you know, genetic modification, illegal tree felling, unfair agricultural and trade practices. Um, uh, so these are, uh, you know, installations that students actually made of plants that they had discovered in protests and protest movements. So this is my most recent project, and uh, it's actually something I did for a friend of mine recently who wanted to send his wife flowers every day during the month of her 50th birthday. And he requested me to research which flowers would be most appropriate to send her. So based on what I knew about my friend's wife, who's also a close friend of mine, I researched descriptions of different flowers to see what aspects of their behavior, their appearance, or botanical structure would align with uh, my friend's nature and her qualities. So first, of course, we had to work with the florist to list which flowers were in season, and then pick from the seasonal list to see which flowers uh, to send her. So I'm showing you three of the many arrangements that were made, uh, the jasmine on the left, the ixora in the middle, and the banana flower on the right. And the, the florist behind these lovely arrangements was uh, Saranya Loginemi. Uh, so of all the flowers, uh, I found the banana one of the most interesting. You know, banana blossoms symbolize prosperity in Hindu traditions, but I chose it because the wild banana plant is known as a keystone species. Uh, that means it regenerates rapidly and uh, it's also a versatile food source for many different animals. So a keystone species uh, helps define an entire ecosystem. Without it, the ecosystem would be dramatically different or sometimes even cease to exist. Uh, so I know my friend's uh, wife plays a vital role in the ecosystem that she occupies. And I know that it would certainly collapse without her in a sense. And hence I chose the banana, banana flower as one of the flowers to be sent to her. And I really hope uh, my, my friend is watching this presentation this evening. Um, I also discovered along the way that the banana blossoms are, are the next big plant-based meat alternative to fish. So if anyone here is vegan, your florist could be uh, potentially become your meat supplier in the future. So I'm going to end with this last slide. Uh, I ran a botanical art and design department at Srishti in 2014 for, for three years with two artists, Leslie Johnson and Prerna Bishnoi. Leslie is also a gardener along with being a visual artist. And through this department, we brought in many ways of studying plants, you know, through floriography, pattern making, truck art, rangoli, gardening, and horticulture. And I end with this image because it uh, encapsulates all that I've been doing for the past few years. You know, I've tried to understand how to approach both botanical and cultural knowledge of plants through art and design. And both are necessary today uh, because of the environmental issues confronting global cultures all over the world. Plant education, you know, be it through art and design or through other fields, must address contemporary critical concerns surrounding the botanical world. And as a concluding thought, I just want to say that I hope that the field develops in India with broad contours. And I hope that academically we make it expansive enough to include all uh, our art, craft and ritual traditions in India. And I very much look forward to a new generation of critical practitioners of botanical art and design emerging. Uh, thank you.
question based on the uh, presentation uh, remember during our discussions where uh, uh, parvati had spoken about showing us the poppy uh, and uh, gitanjali had mentioned that the the decorations that the students did uh, was also symbolizing poppy the paper design so would you like to elaborate a bit on that uh, is the question for parvati or no no for you for you oh the context of the use of the the poppy poppy uh you know th these were poppy protests that uh, were held in plants again uh, in france sorry against the use of pesticides so one of the students discovered these protests and therefore they chose to uh, make these paper make the paper installation about the poppy it was in that context that uh, you know and uh, we have one question from smriti mera uh, around poppy so uh, i wonder about the poppy as it is a western cultural association to war could you talk about the shift of the meaning to south asia as in your work i think as the it? question as I in your work parvati's uh, the pop questions about directed parvati yeah i mean in in a sense the poppy is definitely a western flower and it's come to mean a flower of war and remembrance in the west so i but the poppy is also i mean we do have i think one kind of wild poppy in india and oddly india is one of the few like countries in which the legal growing of opium poppy is licensed and of course there is a dark history to that which you know someone like amitabh ghosh has looked into and it's even now we do grow the opium poppy and i think they sort of uh, uh it's 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 a strange thing that that happens and i think it's sort of it's sometimes even called gulami ki kheti a, a, a slave's crop but i think the poppy is also there you know as sort of in our daily cooking as couscous and poppy seeds it is also if i remember right you know in sort of uh, colonial and mughal painting and you know in in fabric printing and in so it's there is a certain association with the poppy in in our part of the world though the symbolism of it associated with war is definitely a western one i think in my work i was trying to sort of marry the two together in a way of sort of bringing to light a certain part of indian history of indian sort of military history where you never think of the soldiers and i think there was um uh i'm trying to remember the quote of someone who said the indians were sort of sent out in droves to places where they could be slaughtered and you know flanders was one of them and when you read about it it's you know it's such an amazing fact that we don't really think of the indian soldiers who died so keeping in mind that there there are these sort of slightly darker but also very beautiful associations in sort of miniatures and fabric but also in daily cooking as well as you know the opium trade and the presence of the poppy in india i thought it was sort of um, quite appropriate in a way that i used the western poppy which is the sign of remembrance and used it to talk about our indian soldiers that we've sort of forgotten i guess that's the sort of little shift that i tried to do just thank you uh, 
I was wondering if, uh, if there are any more questions, please keep it coming in the chat. Uh, while both of you have been working with flowers so in, intently over the years, how has it been in your childhood or in your growing up years? How has flowers influenced uh, you? Uh, has it, does it have a connection? How, how uh, a thread? Uh, it, question for either one of you. All right, I'll go first because I mean, I can truthfully say that, you know, growing up in Delhi and then later in, uh, in Trivandrum, the, the Poo column, the, you know, we did the 10 days of the Poo column and both in Delhi and in Trivandrum, we were lucky enough to have large gardens. So it was a question of going and gathering flowers for this, for this, you know, Poo column. And it was really quite exciting. And we used, you know, completely, it wasn't sort of always traditional or sacred flowers. I remember in Delhi, you know, the garden, we had snapdragons in the garden and therefore we would put them just because it looked, you know, really, I thought, interesting and different. So I think I was fortunate to sort of grow up with, with flowers around me. And my father was a very keen gardener. He was, uh, he was a general in the army. And he, I think, found flowers as a way of he would grow roses we had these lovely rose beds and he was it was not my mother it was my father who was a keen gardener and it was a way of talking about life and talking about things the you know the garden was uh, uh, was a very important part of growing up sadly I now live in an apartment with no flowers or a garden but I think it's uh, it certainly kind of created an interest in me. It's sort of been part of growing up in a very specific kind of way. Well, Gita, over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I never grew up around gardens and that, you know, this, this, the lovely gardening culture that I know that many, many have had the privilege to, to, to be around. Uh, but my mother was a block printer, and uh, so I uh, grew up with, with, with these block printed fabrics, you know, as curtains, bedspreads, clothing, uh, very abstract forms. I could never identify the exact flower being used. And, uh, uh, but, you know, they were just these floral prints that I, that I always was constantly surrounded by. And then uh, I think when I went to study overseas, uh, you know, botanical art was always about these detailed representations of flowers. And I remember not being able to identify flowers and not, not sort of uh, liking the idea too much, but I was never compelled, uh, you know, I, I, I was never compelled to learn the names of flowers. I was just happy to know them in their abstract, uh, you know, stylized forms. And I think that's really where, where, where this interest in, in, in representation and the floral world started coming in from, from that kind of um, uh, contrast, you know, between the two. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, we have one question from Prakash. He is talking about uh, Tulsi flower. Has the Tulsi flower fascinated you? Uh, it's a question to, for both of you. Sorry, which flower? Let me just look at the chat. Tulsi uh, basil, the holy basil Tulsi flower. Tulsi flower, okay, the holy, the purple flowers. Okay. Uh, I'll, okay, so the I'll, I'll take that first. Not the flower as much really, but the tulsi itself uh, as a plant that is, you know, uh, that is worshipped. And uh, I mean, I, I sort of uh, started looking at these tulsas or these tulsi vrindavans in Goa. These huge, you know, beautiful uh, sculpted forms that you see on the roads uh, in Goa outside the, I think Saraswati Brahmins, that's what the community is that keeps them. But uh, I remember wondering, you know, I, I started looking at these forms and then I discovered uh, a little more about the Tulsi worship and how it's the, you know, it's a form of goddess Vrinda coming. And then I also understood that by virtue of it being a ritual, you, you're keeping a very, uh, a plant with highly medicinal properties constantly in your house, right? I mean, it, it's very good when you have a, when you have a sore throat and uh, it's something that you, uh, some people have every day. Uh, in terms of building their immunity. So, uh, you know, not the flower as much, but the plant itself has interested me for a, for a while, some time ago. Yes, I mean, I haven't really worked with the Tulsi in my work, but, you know, as uh, Gitu very 
sort of comprehensively said, it is a flower that, or the plant per se, is something that is really quite fascinating because it sort of seems to marry the, the scientific as well as the sacred in, in a certain way. It has medicinal properties, but it's also sort of fragrant. You, you know, you go to a temple, you have Tulsi water. There is worship done even now to the Tulsi plant with these Tulsi taras that are made, you know, which uh, there's an elaborate ritual of, you know, worshiping the Tulsi, you know, in the early morning and the night. So it's, um, it's been a flower that, I mean, a plant that I have found incredibly fascinating and how there are stories around the Tulsi and the Tulsi is also almost made anthropomorphic, but no, I haven't actually worked with it in my body of work. Are there any more questions? Okay, uh, we are at uh, 7 to seven, so I think there are no questions we can we, we keep time and uh, so uh, so it, so that the idea behind this talk would okay oh, there's some question yes by madhumati sukumar can you give me an insight of how flowers and devotional connect uh, it's a question for both of you can you give me an insight of how flowers and devotional connect Okay. Well, I, mean, I think, well, uh, you know, as uh, Gitanjali was just sort of saying about how the Tulsi is a sacred flower. I mean, in the same way, there are many flowers and plants which are considered sacred. You know, even the, the Iksora, the Chetipu, it's, it's part of the way in which you worship uh, at the temple in Kerala. I think, I mean, I personally, you know, I've always sort of, I've spoken about this, but I've always wondered, why are they flowers? I mean, yes, they, you know, they're pollinators and they have biodiversity and they are, but they're just so incredibly beautiful. What, you know, what caused them to be? And I think this, I feel there is something sort of very intrinsic and pure about the selflessness of a flower. And I, this is just a personal feeling that that's why they are used to worship as in, you know, they, they, there's a certain selflessness and a certain absolute beauty to them and a certain essence beyond which you can't sort of break it down. And then of course they are, you know, they're fragrant. I mean, they, you know, when you look at the ritual of worship, they sort of say how it is actually meant as a way of, uh, you know, speaking to all the senses. So a flower certainly, you know, certainly captivates you, your visual sense and maybe keeps your eye from straying. And it has this, many of them, many of the flowers we worship with like, the rose and the jasmine have fragrance, which is also very captivating. So I think there's probably a very pragmatic reason why we use flowers for worship. But I think there's also a much, according to me, a deeper sense of tying into something very, very sort of intrinsically pure in, in, in the flower. And of course, with time, with stories, you know, you have different flowers associated with different gods. Speaking to Gitu, I realized that you know, the Ixora itself apparently is a, from a, you know, a Portuguese word and sort of refers to Shiva, you know, the, the translation of it. And there are different flowers associated with different gods because of the seasons and because of where these temples are. And I think it's all sort of richly woven into this sort of very colorful tapestry of, you know, a religious, social, cultural life, I feel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you've put it uh, very, very beautifully. And uh, if I could just add to that, I think that the beauty that, uh, you know, the sense of beauty that a, a flower evokes in, in oneself and the sense of beauty of being in a devotional state, I think there's, you know, there's sim at some level, those could be similar. And I think maybe at some level, we, we, we sort of, there's a, that's what makes us offer. Uh, the flower too, you know, in, in, in the form of worship and in devotion. In devotion, you can't imagine any South Indian temple without flowers. You know, you start, you enter the temple, there are loads of women selling flowers, you know, 
to offer. And then when you go inside, you see these deities being beautifully adorned with flowers. And the priests get so innovative down the years. Mm -hmm. And some of these uh, unknown temples, but the floral decoration will be extraordinary. It'll be for special days, completely with jasmine, completely with tulsi, completely with, you know, they kind of get very innovative, very uh, attached to their uh, deities, their goddesses and gods, and uh, it shows in the way they decorate them. So it's, it's just inevitable to imagine faith, hope, and worship without flowers. Of course, the smell of camphor and the texture of the whole place are uh, all uh, lifting us up, but I think when you think of temples, you, you just think of all that, that comes along with, you know, florals and uh, it starts and ends with florals, <laughs> florals, I guess, from the gate to the inner sanctum. That's how it is. Um, so it, it's part and parcel, but we become just immune because my father was forced in Uti for two, three years and I lived in Kodekanal for a couple of years. And you see them everywhere, you know, blues and reds and purples. And sometimes you become immune to it. And then after a gap, you go back and you start admiring every tiny bit of flower everywhere. You know, sometimes it's so overpowering. And it's, it's, it's sometimes in some of these uh, uh, hill stations, they're all over. And of course, in Tamil Nadu, you'll see these um, Malay is so famous. In Kerala, is more of floral decoration on the floor. And... Uh, Alamedita and things like that. They have more of floral, uh, floor decorative traditions. In Tamil Nadu, you can't miss any street with a whole lot of, you know, flower sellers and uh, garlands, garlands mainly, you know. The God functions right from birth to death ceremony. It's all about garlands. And uh, so it's, it's part of a life, so we don't stand away and look at them, but to uh, look at them and think of them uh, seriously and to go deep into them, uh, to know the meaning of them and to know about the uh, local fauna and flora, you know, it kind of uh, evokes different responses in our minds and <clears throat> I'm really very thankful to both of you for this beautiful uh, journey that you, you know, drew us into uh, the floral design and art and uh, all, of, all of it together. Thank you so much. Yes, and on that note, like how uh, Gita ma'am uh, tied it up beautifully, uh, it, we, we sort of tend to get immune to a lot of things that are constantly around us. And I hope from this talk, I think next time we're going to look at flowers, maybe we go in a step and look, look, look at them for beyond their beauty, what they signify. Um, maybe it might be a joyous occasion or in the case of poppy, a political statement or something that's a bit more darker and uh, give shades to flowers than more than the colors that they're painted in. And uh, thank you so, so much, uh, both uh, Parvati Nair and Geetanjali uh, for uh, taking time off and, uh, uh, for, for, and, and the amazing discussions that went before and for this uh, talk. And uh, uh, with that, we wish you a very happy Onam. Uh, to all of you. Uh, please do follow Dakshin Chitra. We have a lot of events lined up coming up. And uh, when you're in, if you're in Chennai, please do come by. We have two days of Onam festivities planned. If you're not in Chennai, the next time you come to Chennai, please do drop by. We are in ECR Muttikade. And uh, just drop us a DM and we'll, we'll take it forward from there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And yes, thank you. And a very happy Onam to everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Geeta and Lakshmi. Thanks for having us and wish everybody a very happy Onam as well. Welcome.